Yeah, please be seated. Um, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, members of the Faculty of Commerce, members of other faculties, students, and members of the public. The inaugural lectures, uh, and this is the first one in the Faculty of Commerce for probably nearly two years because we uh, did not hold the public inaugural lectures for most of uh, the earlier part of this year and last year. Uh, so the inaugural lectures are an important university event and an important event in the life of an individual academic. For the academic, it represents the ascension to full professorship and in some ways the acme of the academic career, uh, although hopefully there are still many years to go and much to achieve uh, in, in, as a professor. Nevertheless, this really represents um, the fulfillment of the promise of that career. And so it's appropriate to celebrate that inauguration as a professor uh, and to celebrate it with an academic activity, which is a public lecture and a reflection on that professor's work, that body of work. It's also a really important event for the university because it's a public event. Uh, it's the, the style of an inaugural lecture, the, the content and the um, style of that content of delivery is intended to be not for an expert audience in the very specialized area of that professor, which most of us would not understand and uh, would, would therefore not attend, but is intended for a more lay audience, both other academics and members of the public, as a way of sharing with the wider academic community the work of the individuals, hopefully building bridges and stimulating ideas for cross-disciplinary work in the future, uh, giving, uh, giving us all a greater sense of community, that we're part of a, an institution and a body of scholarly activity and scholarship, which uh, has some common goals in spite of the differences in our particular disciplines. And it's also important as an event through which the university gives something back to the public. The, the style and tone is, and the, we advertise this to the public as a free lecture in the hope that members of the public will show an interest, take an interest in the work of the university and that we can share some of what we do with the public. And so it's really a great pleasure to have you all here to have such a full lecture theatre. Uh, and although Professor Rivet was actually promoted uh, nearly two years ago to this position, as I said, because of the uh, interruption in delivering inaugural lectures, um, that lecture is only being delivered today. Um, on, the plat on the platform, at the platform party, uh, we have uh, with me Professor Ingrid Willard, who is the Dean of the Faculty and is going to introduce Professor Rivet, sitting next to her. Professor Owen Brown, who will deliver the vote of thanks. Uh, Professor Mamacheti Pakeng, Professor Loretta Ferris, and Professor Hugh Corder, who are three Deputy Vice-Chancellors, Professor Corder and Acting Deputy Vice-Chancellor. Um, the presence of the three DVCs uh, is again uh, a, a signal, uh, a sim symbolic of the importance we attach both to the achievement of the individual and the celebration of that achievement and to the public inaugural lecture itself. So with that, I'm going to invite the Dean, uh, Professor Ingrid Willard, to introduce the inaugural lecturer. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me enormous pleasure to introduce Professor Ulrika Rivet to you. This is the first inaugural lecture that we have held in the Faculty of Commerce for quite some time, so this is a very important event for us. In addition, Professor Rivet is one of only seven female full professors in the faculty, and the very first female professor in the Department of Information Systems, so this is a particularly special celebration for us this evening. <laughs> Ulrika Rivet was born in Rosenheim, Bavaria, as the middle child of Renata and Günther Brüsler. When she finished school, she really wanted to pursue a career in drama and become an actress. Her father, however, while feeling that this was perhaps a good ultimate career, felt that perhaps in the meantime she should have something to fall back on and should do a more conventional qualification that would certainly be able to feed a family. So based on the advice of her brother, a civil engineer by training, she decided to study land surveying 
and graduated from the University of Munich in December 1994, with her main subject being photo photogrammetry and remote sensing. Soon after graduating, she was invited to Cape Town to continue her studies in the form of a master's degree in the Department of Geomatics under the supervision of Professor Heinz Ritter. She left for Cape Town in January 1995, telling her family that she'd be gone for a couple of years, which it turns out wasn't entirely true. The focus of her master's, which would later evolve into a PhD, was one of documenting the Gaiatoli footprints. Working with archaeologists, her thesis was entitled Development of an Integrated Information System for Archaeological Heritage Documentation, and allowed her the very particular privilege of being able to spend several months in the beautiful Serengeti. While that might sound incredibly romantic, there was something of a downside to this. While it was truly a, 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 you know, a life-changing experience, Ulrika unfortunately also contracted malaria at the time, which um, should serve as a warning to everybody not to over-romanticize um, the joys of fieldwork. <laughs> in the last months of her PhD, she discovered um, a rather awkward need for money in order to sustain herself. And she, uh, she, uh, she decided to take up a job as a waitress in a nearby office block during the lunch period. Had it not been for the serendipitous um, event, she would never have met her husband, Ian, who happened to be one of the customers at that restaurant. So it just goes to show that there is life beyond just, um, just the, the university laboratory. In the year 2000, she joined the Department of Geomatics as a staff member. It was during this time that she shared an office with Nathan Geffen, whom I'm sure many of us know as one of the original um, members of the Treatment Action Campaign. And so during that time, Ulrika and, and, and Nathan spent a lot of time talking about the crisis of HIV AIDS, and that led Ulrika to develop, together with colleagues from electrical engineering, um, Professor Tapson and Professor Davies, a mobile phone app to support home-based care of HIV-positive people. She worked with the Desmond Tutu HIV Center and colleagues such as Professor Wood and Professor Becker. She was able to attract funding for Cell Guy from organizations such as Vodacom, and also, interestingly enough, from the Elton John AIDS Foundation. And Ulrika still remembers to this day the surprise of getting to her office and opening up a letter containing a check for 150,000 pounds with a little handwritten note saying, um, Best, with kind regards, Elton John. In 2002, she joined the Department of Civil Engineering, and during that time, she developed her research profile in ICD for development. She was one of the core members of the Aquatest project, which was funded by the Gates Foundation to the tune of $13 million. During that project, she started ICOMS, a banner under which she still works today. She was also known for always taking her students up to Rhodes Memorial um, to, to, do their, to do their survey work. So on the, on, on the first 10 days of every November, November vacation, um, one would always see these groups of students wandering up to Rhodes Mem, um, doing, uh, doing a real world project under the supervision of Professor Rivet. In 2015, she, she left the Faculty of Engineer, Engineering and the Built Environment and joined us in the Faculty of Commerce um, and joined the Department of Information Systems. This was an opportunity to take her research, her, her research forward and make it part of the mainstream teaching um, it, within ICD for development. As the Vice Chancellor mentioned, in 2016, she was promoted to full professor, and as I mentioned earlier, she became the first woman professor um, ever in the Department of Information Systems. Another very significant part of Ulrika's career here at UCT has been her involvement in university governance, and in particular within the Academics Union. She was president of the Academic Association and was instrumental in its registration as a union. She's been part of the salary negoti negotiations uh, on many occasions, um, uh, even, even after stepping down from a formal role within the academic union, and has always fought very hard for better working conditions for academic staff at UCT. She, she, has been a, she was a member of council for many years and is certainly a, an, an excellent source of institutional knowledge if one wants to understand um, the, 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 the intricacies of how this university functions. Within the Faculty of Commerce, she's chaired the Ethics Committee. Um, and I know she oversaw last year 187 ethics applications. She put many people through, a, a really through, through the mill in terms of ensuring that, that their work was, uh, was to the highest standard. And we, we truly appreciate the, the fact that she is such an incredibly good academic citizen. 
An indication of the heights to which she's, uh, the, the height that, that she's achieved within the university governance structure is that, she has, is that she got to sit on the nominations committee. Now, for those of you that are not at UCT, the nominations committee is the committee that nominates people to sit on other committees. So from that point of view, it really is the highest, the highest um, most significant committee on which to serve and also has the advantage that it doesn't meet very often. <laughs> Besides ICOMS and UCT, Ulrika's core job is to bring up, together with Ian, her lovely children, Anthony and, and, and Jonathan, who are with us this evening. And uh, she tells me that, that, that her sons ensure that their parents remain grounded and focused on family and don't forget what's most important. So with that, I now invite Professor Ulrika Rivett to deliver her inaugural lecture. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for coming out. Uh, it's really fantastic to see you all here. Um, and yeah, and thanks for taking the time to come. So as you heard, I'm by training an engineer, and I'm going to try to share with you why it's so good to be, be an engineer today. Um, but we're also going to talk about a couple of other things. So my talk is entitled ICT4D, or the good intentions of the mobile phone. So ICT4D. Here comes the technical problem. <laughs> Here we go. ICT4D, um, what is it? ICT4D stands for Information Communication Technologies for Development. And I Information Communication Technologies are basically all the technologies we use to, on the one side, make information flow and on the other side, to communicate with each other. So that would be all your mobile phones, your laptops, your computers the cell phone mask, anything that belongs to the context of um, making people communicate. And development is, as you know, speaks really to the notion of international development, developing nations, moving us to better places, and that's what ICT4D stands for. It speaks to information communication technologies and the use of international development. The reason why ICT4D became a really important field in the research arena was because from one minute to the next we had this experience of mobile phones being around everywhere. So from 1995 onwards mobile phone usage exploded. There was a real enthusiastic uptake and what was interesting was that the mobile phone represented the smallest computer that people had in their hand without realizing that it was a computer. It was literally because it was a phone nobody was scared to use it so you had this unbelievable opportunity of having people using something that could be similar to a laptop, but they weren't scared of using it. And you didn't need hours and hours to train them. There was no need, there was no what we call, there was no barrier. And the good thing to this was also, and you can see this is lecture style, so you can see the many points on the, the bullets on the, on the slide. I hope you realize that I do this on purpose, there will be an exam at the end, right? <laughs> um, I, would, I would hate for you to feel that you lost out. So, um, one of the aspects that the mobile phone allowed us to do was to address the notion of bridging what we call the digital divide. The digital divide was the notion of having the half and the half nots, the people who had technologies and the people who didn't have technology. And why that is important is because technology meant that you were developed. So the moment you had a phone, you were more developed than the person who didn't have a mobile phone. And so that experience of bridging the digital divide was a really important point that started around 1995 moving forward. The other thing that happened with the mobile phone was that we had from one minute to the next the opportunity to collect really good data. And you all sitting here and you all have your phones probably on and your bags hopefully on silent. And whilst you're sitting here, I don't know if you know, your net network provider, whoever it is, actually knows that you're sitting here too. And if you speed in your car tonight on your way home and you have your phone in your car and your phone is on, we do know that you're speeding. We might not tell you and we might not prosecute you for it because the law is not at a place where we would do that, but everybody knows where you are. And if you take your phone out and check what ICT4D means on Google, Google also knows that you're sitting here and that you're checking what ICT4D means on Google. So, 
Everybody knows what you're doing the moment you have a cell phone and that op offered an incredible opportunity. It might sound scary for you, but for all of us in the engineering and data collection field, it was a phenomenal opportunity because we could collect data better and faster than we had ever done before. And in the context of development, we also realized that we need better information in order to make better decisions. We know that if we know where, for example, there's a cholera outbreak, we actually can do something about it. If we don't know, we can't do anything about it. And the disasters happen without us realizing. So with all this excitement around the mobile phone, and I hope you are as excited as I am right now to know that this is what a mobile phone can do, these fields developed, M health, M education, M government, M finance, and I'm not making these words up, they exist for real. It was basically recognizing that you can use the phone for far more than just making a phone call. And a really good example in the South African context is a program called Mom Connect. Mom Connect is a national pro program that is rolled out by the Department of Health. And if you're a pregnant woman and you enter the public health service, you will be registered using your mobile phone onto a platform that's called Mom Connect. And you will receive constantly updates about where you are in your pregnancy, that you should go back to the hospital for a checkup, what you should eat, what you should avoid, all of these things. And it's basically a platform that allows us to stay in touch with pregnant women and actually therefore increase the, the well-being of the mother, reduce the risk of mortality, but also the, the mother stays on that program for two years after the child is born, which means we also can protect the child and can support the, the mother in that. So you can see mobile phones can really create connections and make the world a better space. Um, and as you can see on the many M's, there is lots of in different disciplines involved in that sector. So it's a very really interdisciplinary field, and that's also where some of the challenges come from, and, and I will speak to that in a bit. So the D, we have now sort, sorted out the ICT4, and obviously a little bit of uh, WhatsApp um, spelling, ICT4D, and the D is for development. And development is a very complex and controversial and highly contested space, as you can imagine. Who decides what is development, what defines development? And so it has really split the world into two parts. There's the developing and there's a the developed world. And we somehow try to find out who belongs into which world, and we have developed some really good um, indicators. We usually look at aspects such as socio-economic development. We look at how much do you earn, what is your life expectancy, what are the literacy levels. And as long as we use indicators, we feel quite safe because we know we can measure it. There are people, fantastic um, development economists who have looked at other aspects who said perhaps development is not only about measuring numbers, perhaps it's about more than just how much money you have in the bank. And so there's Amaritya Sen who developed the notion of the capabilities approach where he spoke to perhaps development is also defined by your freedom. How much freedom do you have to choose a life that you want to live? What is your capability and ability in that regard? And that's really where I think a lot of our ICT for D space sits in, is saying what, what are the other things? What is beyond the indicator in the socioeconomic development that speaks to the freedom of a person to choose the life that they value? And then, then we have the lovely things because the world still does like to measure and the world likes to have pretty pictures. So we have the so-called MDGs and SDGs. And I do all hope you know what this, that means. Um, I want to uh, ask you to lift your finger if you don't. But uh, the Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs were the goals that we had set ourselves as nation until 2015 to, to basically get the world to a better place. And after that came the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And that's the 70 goals that you see in color here on the screen. And basically in ICT4D, if you work in that space, your work should fall somewhere within these 17 goals and you should find yourself in that. And for a lot of us in the ICT4D sector, because it's the development sector, you are often quite, quite strongly working in an applied field. It's not a very theoretical field because of the simple reason that you're actually trying to make a change to developing the world in a different way. So now, just to talk about my challenge as an academic, since this is my inaugural lecture, I thought I should come clean up front. Um, 
And it is very important, I do believe, to actually put oneself in the place where you come from. So as the Dean kindly reminded everybody, I'm originally from Bavaria. And if you haven't picked it up on my accent, it comes out in my workings. I do believe that Bavarian cars are the best. So, <laughs> um, um, so I, I was trained as a land surveyor. And when you're a land surveyor, you're an interventionist. And I'm sure that all the people in the audience who are theorists will appreciate if one sees up front that you're an interventionist because it means that you believe that intervening is a good thing. Um, so I'm a person that is very happy to see a trick beacon. And I put one here just in case you don't know what a trick beacon looks like. A trick beacon is a sign for me of true civilization. Somebody was there one day, might have been very long ago, but they put this white thing with a little black flag on top. And that thing has three coordinates, x, y, z, and we know where we are. We can control the world because we have all these glorious points. We can map the world. And so when we can map the world, we also have the feeling that we actually know what's going on in the world. And that's a really useful thing. It doesn't make it feel quite so out of control. And so for me as a person, I take great, I take great safety in measurements. And I do also believe that improvement is possible. And I, I talk here about the notion of building a road. If I go into a rural village and the people in the rural village tell me that they would like to go to that other rural village, which is a little bit further away, it's difficult to get there, but they want to get there because there are better shops there or there's family there who they want to visit. My engineering interventionist person will say, great, I build your road. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. If we have some contour line measurements, we know what's a good place to start the road, find the right materials, and there we go, we have a road. So it's quite straightforward, not really complicated. Now, let's just assume on the very same day as I enter that village, um, a, a dear colleague from social anthropology or social science or the humanities field enters the village. That person will come and say, no, 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 you're not building the road. We need first to watch and observe what actually happens in this village. So I will say, OK, that's great. Let's watch and observe. But then we build a road, right? Um, and they will say, no, no, no. Once we watched and observed, we write a report, and then we watch and observe some more. And I will say, and then we build a road, right? And so that's the challenge you face when you work in an interdisciplinary field and you have been brought up as an engineer and you really enjoy numbers. It becomes incredibly difficult to watch and observe, but that's actually core what you have to do if you work in the ICT4D space. So how we started, and um, the dean spoke to that, in 2000, in 2000, the big debates in the country were going on, on around HIV and the pandemic of AIDS and how we were going to manage that. And the key challenge was that it had become very clear that rural clinics were struggling to support people on antiretroviral treatment. There were real questions around the supply chain. How would we get drugs to these different clinics in time? How would we support them? And also, how would we follow up people who were on treatment, how would we make sure that they got the right and necessary support if they, for example, experienced side effects because of the treatment? And so we formed this collaboration in engineering together with colleagues from the health sciences and, and people in, in different universities, the so CPUT and UCT. And we spun, the organization spun out of UCT in 2006 and became an independent NGO and um, was implemented basically what one would say today was the first mHealth initiative across the country and later also in Africa. Now we learned a lot when we did that and I thought this lecture was a good opportunity to share our learning since I wanted to reflect with you on the last 20 years of what mobile phones have done to the continent. And so what we really learned was that you need to take your cues from the cues you see. And there's a lot of cues. If you've ever been in a rural clinic, you will learn that people walk for hours, wait for hours, queue for hours. And if you think you're going to come there with a technology, if that technology doesn't reduce the cues by a vast amount, you don't even need to start implementing your technology. So the biggest challenge for us was not that we could bring great technology. The biggest challenge was we were not given more than two hours time to train. Now, anybody in this room who has used SAP at UCT knows that if you don't have at least three months of training workshops, you will never get there. So we were given two hours. So the constraint on the design of the system wasn't what we could technologically do and what we were able to do. The challenge was the system needs to be 
trainable. You need to be able to train people in two hours and then they need to be able to use the system. And the way it worked was we, it was always a Wednesday, all clinics closed early on a Wednesday, and then you trained from three to five or from three to six at most. The next morning, people would come back in the clinic and you, we would stand next to them for three days and train them on the jobs whilst they were seeing patients. So the constraint of the technology was exactly around can you match the workflow? So a lot of you, if you read any books on supply chain management, you will always read there is efficiency. You can increase efficiency. You can save money. There's somewhere where we can make it more efficient. And obviously, us coming from UCT being very smart, we were going to reduce the queues. I mean, there was no chance. People were definitely going to wait a lot less because we were from UCT. The reality is we couldn't shorten the queues. In actual fact, people in these clinics had worked out the best workflow that we could see. It was just that we needed to watch and observe a little bit longer to realize that. And um, once we had the system down from our side that we meshed the workflow incredibly well, we were able to train people in two hours because they knew what they, we needed to do because it was the, the system represented what they, what they knew already. Um, another thing, that we learned was there, there was a really good idea around the electronic patient record. And, and just to talk about what that means. So if you imagine you have a patient and that patient lives in, in Cape Town and then the patient, the patient is on HIV, also antiretroviral treatment, which is chronic treatment, so they have to take it all the time. They now go on holiday to the Eastern Cape. How do they get their medication in the Eastern Cape? And how do you facilitate that if there's a side effect that you get the information? So, Obviously not a problem for any good engineer. It's an electronic patient record. You have a super record. The record is entered here. And if somebody logs into the system on the other side, they can see all of that. Obviously we ignored with a board sweep, things like patient, doctor, confidentiality, ach, you know, all these other things. And we did take a clue from the fact that the UK had tried for years and years and years and years with lots of millions of pounds to implement that system and never got it right. So we thought that perhaps that should be a sign to us that if the UK can't do it, we might not be able to do it either. So we left that. But there was a real need to get the data. So there was a reason for wanting a patient record because you need to know how many people are sick, how many people need medication, what are the side effects that are occurring. So there is really, it's not, it's not a joke to have a patient record because you actually need that information. Um, and what we then realized, what the, the silver bullet for our system was actually the pharmacist because pharmacists love counting and they love numbers. And when you give them a computer, they're very happy people. And if you say to them, why don't you enter into the system what the doctor wrote? They're also the only people in the clinic who can read the doctor's handwriting in case. <laughs> so, because sometimes the doctor can't read his own handwriting. So it was actually quite profound. And the only reason we figured this out was because we watched and observed for so long that we realized the only people that could do that were the pharmacists. And the other thing was, was really interesting because the patients had now seen the nurse and the doctor. They were on their way home. So all they had to do is go to the pharmacist. So they were, there was no experience of their waiting times increasing because there was the last, last stage of the clinic visit. So they would go home right after that. So that shortened the experience of, oh, I don't have a uh, delay. I don't have to wait longer. So with all these great learnings in our pockets and having done so much work and have gotten so much wrong and then somehow fixed it in the end, we moved into the water and sanitation hygiene sector. So we left the HIV sector and moved into what's called the WASH sector. And it's literally called the WASH sector, water and sanitation hygiene. One of the biggest sector in the development context, one of a really important sector because there are so many people that are still dying because of waterborne diseases and we ought to get this right. It is really something that, that irks me that we can't get water and sanitation uh, to a better place. So again, in water and sanitation, there was great enthusiasm for the use of the mobile phone and how we could facilitate better data collection. A lot of experience, uh, people experienced it as a low hanging fruit. There were things that we could fix quite easily, better data we could collect. But as always, as life in general, it always turns out more costly and more complex than you anticipated. And the other thing that, that was a real challenge was a huge pilotitis. And pilotitis is when everybody starts a pilot project. There were pilot projects, so many pilot projects, you could have called it a national rollout of pilot project. And in some countries, the governments had to actually put a moratorium to more pilot projects because 
their government officials were answering more questions of researchers and what they were doing their job. And so that became a real challenge. The other thing, I don't know how many of you have done Politics 101, or if you could even imagine what the course Politics 101 looks like, but if you work in the water sector, you better enjoy that course because there's no sector that is more political than the water sector. If you think water is about running down the hill, it is absolutely not. There is every NGO you can imagine in that sector, any big organization from the World Bank to the Oxfams, every government level. So you're not only dealing with local, you're dealing with provincial, you're dealing with national level. And if you just look at Cape Town at the moment and the drought, you know how complex water management is. So we were involved in the AquaTest project and the project was funded through the Gates Foundation and it was one of the most amazing projects I've been involved in. It was five years of projects with five different organizations across the whole world. Um, we we were, had fantastic support from the Gates Foundation. You get your personalized program manager and they help you to understand what the world looks like according to Gates. And we then were given the opportunity to have, to, so, so basically what the project was about was you had one group of the team developed a test kit to test uh, water in the field. So if you test water for E. coli bacteria, which is basically the bacteria mainly responsible for diarrhea or cholera diseases, um, they, the challenge is that you have to test that water in the lab and the best opportunity to change what we currently experience is to develop a test kit where you could test for uh, E. coli bacteria without ne needing a lab. And our job was to develop then a mobile app that would transfer the results of the water test to decision makers and stakeholders. And the small but relevant request from the Gates Foundation was just make it, design it in a way that it's scalable globally, which is quite understandable if you come from the Gates Foundation because that's what the windowization of the world is like, you make it global. All right, so this, the system was quite easy. We had a water, um, a borehole in most of the countries, you would have a borehole to a water source. That water source would be tested by an operator with a simple field test kit. The operator would then enter the results in the phone. The data would be collected at a central database and you would then have managers or stakeholders who could look at the data on different platforms and in different environments. So when we started the project, it started out with this notion of let's build an app for Africa. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is because the challenges we have or the challenge we have that is that is that notion of Africa is a country. And I'm saying that because there would never be a notion of saying let's develop an app for Europe. That just wouldn't exist. Nobody would ever try to sell the same app to the Germans that they, bought, that they built in, in Spain. It just wouldn't happen. And uh, that might sound funny, but it's actually not funny because the situation was that there was a real hint and an underlying threat in a lot of the discussion that we can build a global app for all these developing countries. You wouldn't try that for the developed world. And that was a real challenge because it also really questioned where we came from and where our ideas came from. And as I say here MS Office versus clean water. The challenge around, you all know that you all, probably all of you use MS Office, right? Everybody used Microsoft Office. And you all accepted it. And, but all you do with it is really writing letters and emails, perhaps a little bit faster than if you did it by hand. But the reality is there isn't that much difference. When you have a water test kit, where you're trying to test water in different countries in very different circumstances, there is no way that I can build something that will work for everybody in the same way, because all countries have different um, um, law frameworks and so on to actually make that happen. Then came this notion of everyone has a phone. Um, a good academic knows that you never have any words in a thesis that start with everyone or anyone or every anything. That just is not a good idea to have because as soon as it starts with then you can absolutely be sure that there is one person who doesn't have a phone. And the reality is that probably one can say in today's world there that the majority of the population of the world have access to a phone. That doesn't mean that they have a phone. Having access and having a phone are two very different things. The other challenge we had was this notion of the experts. As I said to you, the, the environment is very political. We were given some of the best experts in the team because it was so well funded. So the question is, who is the expert? 
is the expert, the person at the World Health Organization that has been working for years and years and years in the field of water, is the expert, the borehole operator who has to fight off the people from the village when they don't get water, who actually are the experts? And in the design of a system, what you usually do is you try to get people in to help you, assist you in designing the system. So you have to identify these experts. And it became very quickly clear that the biggest challenge is actually to find the expert. Um, and that was an interesting notion to learn. And then there is this other aspect. I don't know, I'm sure there's nobody in this room who's ever used the internet capacity of the University of Cape Town to book their holiday because you just wouldn't do that because that would be using the bandwidth of the university, what the university pays for, to actually fulfill a personal, a personal thing, right? You would also not use the phone in, the in your office to phone um, your son to help him with the homework. You would do no such things because that's not what we do. But the reality is that's what we all do all the time. We use the internet here and nobody try, try asks you for it. People are quite okay with it. But the challenge is that in a development project that became a key hindrance because people said, we're gonna give borehole operators phones, we're gonna give them money so that they can send the results through and now these operators are gonna use that money for something else. They're gonna download music. You need to stop them. So we said, you can't stop them. How do you develop a business model where you say you're going to not make sure that people... Isn't it development? Isn't it development if you now go and download music and you learn how to... Isn't that part of development? Where does development stop? So in a development project, it's not clear who pays for the download of the music. And that actually becomes a real hindrance because you now need to get everybody in line and say, this is work, so you can't download music. That's not what we do. And so these are little, small little things, but that are really inhibitors to rolling out technology at a grand scale. But with all of these problems aside, the best thing about, about these projects in, in every situation is that we get to travel to the most amazing places. And so uh, I thought I'd show some good pictures so that you get appropriately jealous uh, about my last 15 years of working at UCT. So one of the places we went to was the uh, Chris Harney district. Chris Harney district is in the Eastern Cape of South Africa and the main town of the place is Queenstown. Now, the Chris Harney district is the size of Switzerland. Sometimes we need to remind ourselves how big South Africa is. South Africa is three times the size of Germany. Now that might not mean a lot to you, but it means a lot to me. Um, and you have a, one district, one municipality is the size of Switzerland. There's 800,000 people living in that municipality with one mayor. There are three environmental health officers. Environmental health officers are the people that are responsible for example, to check the abattoirs, to check the restaurants, to check anything that has to do with health. They meant to test the water. In a place that has 800,000 people living, you should test the water once a month on all sources, okay? You have three, you, they shared, the three people shared one car in a place that's the size of Switzerland. And then what became very clear is that despite all of these really strenuous circumstances, they did a marvelous job. And I really realized that that's a, one of the challenges we often have is that we don't understand the different levels of government. So something that happens in Pretoria at national level is not at all a reflection of what happens at local level. So sometimes you can have the most amazing service delivery at a local level um, and actually it, what you see at national level is not at all a reflection of what happens at local level. And I think that also speaks to what the water sector is all about. Then we went to Alfred and Zoo, and Alfred and Zoo district was really interesting. Our Alfred and Zoo district is Matatiele on the border to Kokstad to the, the KwaZulu Natal border. Very contested environment as well. Um, interesting here was that you had 88% of households had no access to sanitation. And I mean no access. Okay, these are environments where the, the, the circumstances of living are incredibly dire, and I would suggest that the majority of us really would struggle to live there. 0.4% um, had internet access, and 59% of people had cell phone ownership. This is the place where you go when you don't like people. This is Hunter Municipality. Hunter Municipality is in Calvinia, and the, the population density is one person per square kilometer. Iceland has three people. <laughs> okay, so this is really, there's really nobody living in this place, all right? Um, 
It is an amazing place. You can see here, this is where the, the area. So here's Middlepost, it's one of the small places. 90 people living in Middlepost. It doesn't matter, you're the mayor of Calvinia, you're still responsible for Middlepost, even if it takes you an hour and a half to get there on a road that has potholes the size of cars you still have to look after these people. So for any decent engineer, this is a nightmare. You would like them all to move to Calvinia <laughs> and stop being in middle pause because to deliver services to middle pause is a real challenge. And so every single team member learned how to change tires. We usually practiced outside the chemical engineering building. <laughs> you did not need to come and join our team if you didn't know how to change a 4x4 tire. And that's the reality of doing ICT for D research. This is what you do. We then went to Cambodia and that was an amazing experience because as I said to you, the project was about the developing world and right, if it's the developing world, we're also equal. And so we can quite easily move from Krasani district to Cambodia, shouldn't be a big problem at all. So we went to Cambodia and what was interesting here was the notion of Khmer. Khmer is the language of Cambodia and when we got there, we realized that nobody had a programming language in Khmer. We, did, we were unable to develop our application in Khmer because there was no script for it. We couldn't actually program it. So what we had to do is the greatest humiliation that you can imagine. We gave people pieces of paper that reflected these, the words that they had in English. So what the all operators in Cambodia had to do, they matched our menu in English to the Khmer language on a piece of paper. So we handed out um, basically laminated sheets. Now imagine we are an IT group. We hand out laminated sheets, here's the English, here's the Khmer, work your way through the menu. Uh, there was for us a complete fail. Our software, our technology had completely failed. The interesting thing was that the people in Cambodia, the people in, the, in this particular NGO felt that we had developed them. We had upskilled them. We had taught them every single term in English and they absolutely loved the setup, which is completely opposite to what one would expect from our side. We went to Vietnam and in Vietnam, we learned that people can really measure. People measured with an absolute belief. They measured the same side 15 times pH values on a regular, on a regular situation. And for us, the challenge was that we had too much data. We had books and books and reams and reams of data. And there was no way that our little mobile app could cope with the data. The interesting thing was that we suggested, we we creatively and openly that it would be a good idea to just send us through the average. And I've never seen a person's face drop like that because in that moment I patronizingly had suggested that his measurements were not important. I had completely undermined what he was doing every day. He didn't care if somebody came and checked the book because there were reams and reams of books with data that nobody had ever looked at. But that was his job. It didn't actually matter if anybody looked at it. And so we learned that by simplifying his job and saying, oh, just send us the average number, that's far better. We literally undermined who he was, and that was a really important learning for us as a team. In Mozambique, we worked with UNICEF, and that was really complicated because in Mozambique, we actually learned this notion of everybody has a phone, there is cell phone network coverage everywhere, was a complete misnomer. We literally walked around with the hand held up high, finding a hill and trying to see if anybody, anybody out there wanted to send us a signal. And there weren't a lot of people. So, this, again, this really gave us a little bit of humbleness in our approach. And then I'm sure there are, I know there are a couple of people here who have worked in the education sector and, and are education researchers, and I, I know this was probably going to be embarrassing if I say this, but um, there was this notion of we just train, we roll out training, and you know, there must be a one size fits all. And so, just to give you a quick overview, in Cambodia we trained all sitting around the table. In Vietnam, we trained everybody sitting in a row and people being organized by rank. In South Africa, we trained next to the bucky. We trained in a room. Sometimes the woman spoke, sometimes the woman kept quiet. Sometimes it was a question about rank. Sometimes it was a question around age. There was no one size fits all. And it took us a long time and we made lots of mistakes to even understand how training would work. And coming in with a technology was probably one of the hardest things because even the experienced trainers in the countries often didn't know how to train on the technology. So what did we learn? We learned the notion of co-design and 
co-design is really around trying to co-develop with another group, co-design with the local experts to really identify the local experts and find the people on the ground that actually need to use the system, but also identify the people who will benefit from it. One of the biggest challenges that we are facing even now in Cape Town with the water crisis is you have on the one side decision makers, you have on the other side people implementing systems, but on the last point is us who use water and us who shower and us who flush toilets and we are the beneficiaries of any system that gets implemented that manages water. So we realize that the notion of the lo local expert is absolutely crucial if you want to manage any resource such as for example water. The other challenge that we really have is that our mobile app was not developed for E. coli bacteria. The nice thing about E. coli bacteria is they don't mind where they are. They in, behave the same in Munich, in Hong Kong, in Batambang, in Krishani district. E. coli bacteria just work. They, 37 degrees, they're heavy, happy and multiply at a rate of knots. 18 degrees, they don't move at all and just sit quietly. Um, and that's not what humans do. Humans do different things all the time. So when you then try and scale something, it doesn't work because you don't have the same expectation for everybody. Another thing that happened to us was the notion of sustainability. I spoke about sustainable development and sustainability in the context of ICT4D. Whilst we were doing our research, the world actually changed and we didn't watch. So in 2008, the global crisis happened and we had developed our incredible tool. We had basically created a model that could be bought out by a Johnson Johnson 3M or any of the big companies to mass manufacture and save the developing world. We had tested it, we had prototyped it, it was there. And then what happened was that neither one of any of these companies wanted to invest because there was no benefit. There was no profit to be made on a device that would be thrown into the developing world. And as, as one of the gentlemen so inappropriately said to us, it was a bottomless pit. So what they did suggest to us, because they're as good as we are as engineers, they said to us, why don't you redesign it a little bit and we sell it to Canadian campers who are on holiday watching bears. And um, we decided that wasn't quite what we had intended. And so uh, that was the end of that project. But that's the reality. If you don't watch what happens around you, if you sit in the university lab and you design, the world moves on. They're not waiting for you. And the other notion was this notion of improved decision making. Did we really improve anything? The, we, the challenge we had was that for some of the people in Chris Harney district, our system became actually caused them depression because what they did was they saw more and more how many problems they had. From one minute to the next, they could count the challenges they were facing, but they only still had one car. We never got them another bucky. All we did was we gave them tons of data of how much work they should do, how much more they should do, and how much better they should be delivering if they would have another bucky but the phone never made the bucky. The phone just gave them lots of data. We had all this learning done, and I'm gonna be very quick now because I know this is getting long, but there is some more to come. Community engagement. And at the same time as we were doing this work, service delivery protests were happening across the whole country with regards to water. And so we still believe to this day that if you were to support communities by giving them more information, and if communities on the other side can give us better information, we will actually be able to bridge that communication gap that currently exists. The other good thing about South Africa, which makes South Africa very, very special, is that public participation is actually part of the municipal law. You have to engage with the public. You, have, you can enforce that by law through the constitution. It is your right to contribute. And as a citizen, you're actually part of local government. And so that was a really interesting notion because it gave us an opportunity to really speak differently to municipalities and say, this is not an optional extra. It's not about do you like to speak to the public. It's actually you have to speak to the public. So we try to help communities also to understand that, or municipalities to understand that the people who experience the problem always must be part of the solution. You need to recognize local knowledge and you need to increase engagement in order to also increase the transparency. Now the challenge with that is if you come from an in, uh, engineering background and if you come from any innovative background, there will be a statement, and it has been subscribed to Henry Ford, however, I would not want to be captured on tape saying anything negative about any American car manufacturer. So 
it is said that um, he said, if I would have asked them, referring to the client, what they wanted, they would have told me a faster horse. Now you can say, is that a reality check or is this just arrogance? Because the reality is probably Steve Jobs would have said exactly the same. He was a person, for example, that very strongly believed you should never ask your customer because your customer doesn't have a clue what he or she likes. You give it to them and then they change. And if you look at some of the systems implemented, let's say at UCT to manage finance, you would assume the same because you don't ever get the impression that anybody asked you if you liked that system with three letters or if you didn't. So. Is it, uh, is it reality or is it arrogance from the engineers? Do we know better because we know better because we know better? Or is it a question of how do we engage? And so the question then is, is a faster horse ever a solution? Should you ever be satisfied with a faster horse? Now the argument could be made if you are taking part in a horse race, yes, the faster horse is a really good option. You don't want a car because you're being disqualified at the starting point. Then the question is, should anyone be happy with the faster horse or should we drive to it? And when you look up the opposite of technology on Google, what is the opposite of technology? You know what it is. It's things like underdevelopment, it's things like chaos, it's things like physical labor. So when there is no technology, it clearly means nobody has switched on the light. So everything is then called, we call it very sweetly in our context, low-tech solution. It's a low-tech solution. But the reality is that for a lot of places, pen and paper are a really good opportunity. And you can again, let's take the example of UCT. Why do you make academics fill all the pieces of paper? Because we know that they're good at that, <laughs> right? We're not giving them access to the computer for a reason. So. The risk in the development sector, however, is if you push technology, you actually may cause a lot of damage. And I think that's the key challenge. It's a great thing to use technology. But what is the risk you're taking when you're implementing a technology that you can neither maintain nor support in the long run? Now, we still haven't given up. So we, there's more learning, can you believe it, after all these years. And now we have said, OK, let's look, because of Cape Town, at the middle to high income households. Surely they're easier. They're not development world. Surely they're easier. Um, and then you realize that the only people wasting water right now in Cape Town are the middle to high income. Actually, only the high income. Let's just be real, all the people with swimming pools and gardens. So. We developed an app that is meant to help high and low in and high, middle and high income households to monitor their water usage. And all that it requires you is enter um, your water meter readings and basically you will then be given a little um, graph to show you how much you water you use on a daily basis. Interesting enough, a lot of people didn't know that they have a water meter when they own a house. <laughs> Some of them didn't know where the water meter was, so we created a little find your meter help function. <laughs> that in decent Apple design graphics requirements fulfills the need to show you where your water meter is. Okay, um, There is a lot of re learning in that. The one thing that we learned was that the app has a lifespan. Uh, you all will have had that. Besides, you were addicted to something like Candy Crush. Most of you have the experience. You use an app, you download it, you use it for two weeks, and you give up on it, and it moves on. The question is, can we use the two weeks that you use that app to change your behavior so successfully that you will stop wasting water, even if you only use it for two weeks? And we're incredibly glad to work with our colleagues in economics who really have a good understanding of behavioral nudges, and they give us the tips and tricks on that. The other first finding we had immediately is there's no button on the app that makes it rain. So if you're looking for that, technology will not solve that. So 20 years later, where are we? And I think what we do now, and there's no question about it, we have more phones, we have more access, we have more connectivity. We know, we know that. We have more information and we have more data. Sometimes that information might be depressing, but we have the information. We know better what we ought to do. We haven't gotten wiser because of it. We haven't gotten more knowledge because of it. But we do know more stuff. 
We also know, and I think that's another really great experience that I've had within our sector, there is a real recognition that technology cannot solve social problems. And I think that has, has been really ringing true for a lot of people that have worked in the sector. We will not solve any social problems with technologies. And in the end, it's always the beneficiaries that decide on the success of any of your ICT systems. So it's not the people that use the system and it's not the client. The client can be somebody like in our case, the client was the Gates Foundation, right? They're paid for it. Or it can be the city of Cape Town is the client. But the client doesn't decide how good your app is. The people who decide how good your app is is the people who get or don't get water. That's the people who decide how good it, the technology is that you developed. And then because I can't let you go without giving you a little formula, because that's what we do in a scientific environment. So here's your formula to learn off by heart. SC plus M equals PA. SC stands for sanitation crisis. M is the mobile phone. So sa sanitation crisis plus mobile phone gives you protest action. Very simple. <laughs> Very simple, a key reminder, take that home, it remains like that. The only question is how big SC is defines how big PA will be. <laughs> All right, so my, star, my talk started out with saying um, the good intentions of the mobile phone. And, and I, I really love that saying the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I think it's a phenomenal say, uh, saying for the context of ICT4D and the development sector. There is so much good intention that sometimes we who work in that sector, we know the pavement. We know what the pavement looks like and we can pave. And we will pave and continue to pave because we know that and we don't look where the direction of our road is going. We have lost that section completely. So in the ICT4D sector, you have to be incredibly careful which direction you are paving. You have to be incredibly careful to understand what the unintended consequences are. Sometimes the unintended consequences can be very positive, like I talked about the, the borehole operator in Cambodia who learned English and she felt this was a real development, but sometimes the consequences can be incredibly negative and you can really cause damage to a community, to a village where you go and you leave with the wrong set, um, with having disappointed. Another thing, in academia we talk about this publish and perish. In our sector, publishing isn't actually that difficult. You can easily publish academically. You can become a real hero being an academic accolade published academic. But what we often forget is there's this notion of you need to publish for the people who work in the sector, not for the people who are academics who are never gazing at each other and saying, oh, this guy wrote another yet fabulous paper. The challenge is that there are people out there that are currently implementing systems that are costing us a lot of money. And these systems are completely ignoring all the experiences and all the data we have collected. It's like we have written a paper about the fact that water doesn't boil at 20 degrees. And there are people out there right now that promise other people that they can boil water 20 degrees. And there's literally nothing more frustrating when you see that development agencies are handing money out to projects that we know will fail because we've been there, we've done that, and we seriously got the t-shirt. And it's really a, a challenge to us as academics to publish in a way that the people in the sector of ICT4D actually start taking seriously what, what we do and what we find and what we research. And I do believe that the notion lies sometimes in publishing without using, let, without using words that have eight letters and end is ologies. So we should just leave the epistemologies and ontologies and methodologies and then perhaps somebody will read our papers. And we need to remain relevant to our context. So what's the challenge we set ourselves? As, as the Vice Chancellor said, I'm hopefully here for uh, some more years, I have some more work to do. So we will travel along the road of ICT for a lot longer. I, I really do believe technology can make a difference. We will try to avoid paving the wrong direction, the road in the wrong direction, and we will learn and share as we go along. Thank you very much. I uh, have to restrain myself from stealing the thunder of the person who is going to promote, uh, to, to, to give the vote of thanks, uh, Professor Owen Brown, so I'll call him up first, but I do want to say that was so enjoyable, so such plain speaking, such humour and wit, uh, and bringing, bringing the truth uh, back home.
Um, thank you, uh, Ulrike. Thank you, Professor Rivet. Um, Professor Irvin, Ra Irvin Brown. Okay, thanks very much for that uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, lecture. <clears throat> so on behalf of the Department of Information Systems and the head of department, Kevin Johnston, who unfortunately cannot be with us today, we thank you all for the uh, attending. It's nice to see a full house at such an auspicious occasion. We thank the Vice Chancellor, Dr. Price, the Deputy Vice Chancellors, Professors Parking, Ferris and Corda, and the Dean of Commerce, Professor Willard, for this opportunity and their attendance and support today. We, of course, especially thank Ulrika, firstly, for joining the Information Systems Department and the Faculty of Commerce just over three years ago. She has brought a lot of energy, as you can see, to the department and a focus on our, our task of being both rigorous in our research and, of course, relevant. So we tend to focus on the rigor and not so much the relevance, and you can see where she's pushing us. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so uh, we thank you again for that interesting and informative inaugural, inaugural lecture, in which you have shared from your rich experience how it is to engage with the good intentions of the mobile phone in the service of development. One of our leading scholars in information systems, Jeff Walsham, in reflecting on the IS, Information Systems Research Agenda, posed the question, are we making a better world through ICTs? Now, after listening to Ulrika's lecture, we can say surely that, yeah, there are some researchers that are indeed making a better world through ICTs. Now, Sandeep Sahay, another leading IS scholar, then later suggested further lines of inquiry in asking, okay, who are we in terms of making a better world? And we can see the uh, learning and the lessons learned from Ulrika's experience of co-design. We are not the experts as researchers going in to save the world. There are people at local level with knowledge that are capable of at least understanding better their circumstances. We can also ask the question, better for whom? Who are we making it better for? For ourselves or for the most vulnerable in society? What do we mean by better? More advanced technology, is it always better? And Ulrika has addressed that question. And finally, does ICT always lead to a better world? And Ulrika talked about the unintended consequences and it's not always about the better and the best technologies in every circumstance. So I like particularly the portrayal of the mobile phone as being an actor which also has intentions to do good. And um, well, okay, I suppose as, as, a, as a theorist, if you like, <laughs> it reminds me of a, a theory called actor network theory where we recognize technology also as an actor. So in closing, I would like to express a special thank you to those who have made this event possible and who did all the behind the scenes work that has brought us here today. To the students, I can see several of uh, Ulrika's students, master's, PhD, and our own students from the department. Uh, we especially thank you for your attendance. It means a lot to us. And finally, of course, it is important to thank those that are closest to Ulrika, her family. You can see um, all of them here today. And we are grateful that you have given her the support to bring her to where she is today. And um, finally, again, to thank you all once again for joining Professor Ulrika Rivet on this special day. May it go well with you. Thank you. <clears throat>